Chicago, Illinois, 1924. Two young college graduates wanted to pull off the perfect crime without getting caught, but still getting attention. It did not turn out the way that they planned. This is a story of Leopold and Loeb. Hello, good morning. This is Kelly from Kelly's Coffee and Crime Chat. I am here to bring you an old case. This will be up early on Spotify Premium and Patreon. So I wanted to get this up early. This is Wednesday, January 31st, last day of January. So I will have it up probably Friday, February 2nd. So I wanted to get this up early a couple days for my subscribers. I tried to do this um, as early as I can get them written out. Uh, notes written out and read and all of that and recorded. So uh, my sources are smithsonianmag.com and wikipedia.org. I am drinking Java Mama Bananas Foster. It is so good. I think, I don't know if I drank this on the last one. I'm not sure. But right now this is part of our Mardi Gras set. And I've never actually had the dessert, but... I want one, an actual dessert, and I want to have it in New Orleans. <laughs> mm. You got your bananas, your rum flavor, your brown sugar, your whatever else goes in a banana's foster. And oh my gosh, and then they set it on fire. They have it now in a cup of coffee. Java Mama's clean and green. Better for your gut, and I will have the link in the show notes. And don't forget our tea, cooking spices, hot cocoa. All kinds of things are on the site. All kinds of things. So I will leave that link. Okay. Um, this one, I've heard of the names, but I didn't know the details of this one. This is Leopold, Leopold and Loeb. Um, I just don't know what to think. Wow. Um, I will go ahead and start... Um, or it seems like I'm forgetting to say something, but maybe not. Um, but anyway, if I forget, if I remember, I'll say it at the end. Um, again, thank you for all your support. $5, you get all of my bonus episodes. There's 15 bonus episodes up there right now. And I have about six chapters of Stranded in Time read by me. And I am good as far as winging it and talking, but reading you can kind of tell when you listen <laughs> I'm reading word for word and I don't do as good at that but I try so I'm hoping people are enjoying that stranded in time mystery murder mystery and uh, time travel okay here we go Nathan Leopold Jr. he was born November 19th 1904 in Chicago he was the third son of Florence and Nathan, and they, Florence and Nathan Leopold, and um, they are a German Jewish immigrant family. He spoke his first word at age four months and had success later in life with 15 different languages. He studied 15 different languages, but spoke fluently five of them. He became an orthon, or if I could say this, ornithologist and that is the study of birds I'm so sorry if I'm not saying that right um, so he was very very intellectual a very smart person um, Richard Allen Loeb he was born June 11th 1905 also in Chicago he was also the third son now they had four sons he was the third son in his family just like Nathan Leopold he was the son to Hen Anna, Henri Anna Henrietta and Albert Henry. Same initials. Um, Albert was a wealthy, wealthy lawyer and he was vice president of Sears, Roebuck and Company. 
he was Jewish and Anna was Catholic. So we've got the Jewish in the family, just like Leopold. Um, he was also very smart. Um, Richard loved to read, especially crime and history. He was the youngest graduate of the University of Michigan at age 17. This is a university. He started at age 12 with high school studies, and he finished that by age 14. Now, that's amazing right there. Um, he was social, but where Nathan Leopold was more, he was just strictly intellectual. So Richard Loeb was the more social one, where Leopold was kind of an introvert. Um, didn't really like socialize much, go out much or anything. Now they both grew up in Kenwood, which is a neighborhood in Chicago's South Side. And um, the Loeb's had a mansion two blocks from the Leopold's. Um, they became friends later, later at the University of Chicago where they both attended after the University of Michigan. Loeb ended up taking history classes there at the University of Chicago. Um, so they knew each other kind of casually through their lives because they lived so close but they didn't actually become friends until later and then I also heard I read one source that said they were actually they ended up becoming lovers um I don't know exactly if that's true I'm thinking it is because there was a couple sources that did say that and it was even written in a magazine article when they were at trial um, Leopold was into Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche if I could say that, N-I-E-T-Z-C-H-E. -E. He was a German philosopher. He was also into Nazism. He had written manuscripts, and after he died, um, a relative of his, I can't remember exactly if it was a wife or who the relative was, but she had his manuscripts published, and there was a lot in there with Nazism. And Leopold thought he and Loeb could become men who were above the law as in a superman as in nobody can touch them almost like another god because this Nietzsche guy wrote about how god is dead and i'm thinking they thought they could become a god like god again or something so they started getting into vandalism and theft they broke into a frat house at the university of michigan then they then they uh, started some fires, a couple fires, arson. And they're doing this just to see if they get away with it. And basically, and um, that no, they could like, like the law couldn't touch them. Like they were going to make like they were going to be in control. Now, since nobody was talking about them, they were not happy. They wanted attention. That's what they wanted when they were doing these petty crimes. So they planned what they called a perfect crime to make them supermen. That's quote unquote supermen. After all, their theft only consisted of $80, watches, pen knives, a camera, and a typewriter. Way too petty. They wanted Chicago talking. Now Loeb said in order to do this, they needed a child. That's what would wake people up. Kidnapping and murder. Plus a ransom would be the icing on the cake. Leopold was all for it. They discussed and planned this crime for hours over the winter and thought maybe $10,000 was a good amount to ask for. Now back then $10,000 was a lot. I, I forgot to look up what that was today, but they would, have, they would have the victim's dad throw a packet of money from a train that went south along the tracks of Lake Michigan. They'd be there waiting with a vehicle to take the money, right? Perfect plan, right? I also have the, uh, I found an image of the ransom note that I'll have in my photo dump on Instagram at Patreon so people can see it. Um, they drove around on May 21st, 2024, so 100 years ago almost. They drove around a rental car looking for their victim. About ready to give up after two hours, Loeb saw his cousin, Bobby Franks, walking along the side of Ellis Avenue. His cousin. He knew Bobby's dad was wealthy. He was like a big businessman. And Leopold turned around, turned the car around, drove it around in a circle, and pulled up alongside Bobby. 
Loeb offered him a ride. He said no, he was almost home. No, he didn't want to get in. Loeb kept talking to him and talking to him, talking because Loeb played tennis and so did Bobby. So he started talking about a tennis racket. He wanted to get a tennis racket for someone and his brother wanted one and he wanted to talk to him about it. Well, eventually after talking, um, Bobby would like move closer to the car and then he finally just slid into the front seat because Loeb was sitting in the back where Leopold was driving. Now that right there is a red flag. If you see anybody like that, that's very strange that one would be in the back one would be in the front and they're trying to pick you up so um Loeb introduced Bobby to Leopold and as he was talking to him he was he felt around in the seat for the chisel that he had um he planned to use it as a club I guess one end was like a blunt like a dull side that can be used as a club when Bobby wasn't looking, he was looking front because he was in the front seat. So he was looking out the front of the car and um, he would turn around and talk to Loeb and then he would turn back around. Well, Loeb made his move. He grabbed him, covering his mouth with his, with his hands and bashed the chisel into his skull. And he did this many times because Bobby was still alive. Bobby even raised his arms to protect himself. And the fourth blow actually made I should have said this before that this is a trigger warning if I forgot to mention that at the beginning of this this is a trigger warning so if you don't want to hear what happened to Bobby um, you can fast forward just a few a couple I don't know how long maybe a minute or so um, or take a break <laughs> uh, the fourth blow made a hole in his head blood came running all over the seat the floor and all over Leopold um, he was still alive even after that. So Loeb took Bobby, dragged him up and back over the seat, jammed a rag down his throat until Bobby stopped moving. They disposed of Bobby's body in a culvert. Um, eyeglasses fell from Leopold's jacket pocket, or I don't know if it was a jacket pocket or they were just like slung over. You know how you just take an arm of your glasses and um, stick them in the collar. I, I think that's what he did. I'm thinking, I'm not sure, but they fell out. And they dropped the ransom note into a mailbox. It was like a courtesy box that we have that's out. The public mailboxes where um, the carriers pick up mail. And it was to be delivered the next day. But someone just happened to see Bobby's body and call police. Now their perfect plan was over, basically. They found the eyeglasses and they knew, they found out that they were Leopold's. I don't know how they did it back then, but they knew they were Leopold's glasses. They found out somehow. 10 days later, they confessed and they showed how they murdered Bobby and the typewriter they used to type the ransom note, that was the one they stole from the frat house that they broke into when they were doing their petty crimes. So that also gave them away. They said they did it just for the thrill. And here's a quote that was in a newspaper. Leopold quoted this. A thirst for knowledge is highly commendable. No matter what extreme pain or injury it may inflict upon others. A six-year-old boy is justified in pulling the wings from a fly. If by doing so, he learns that without wings... The fly is helpless. Oh my gosh. Okay. Everything made this crime the most intriguing in the history of Cook County. Because the families were wealthy. They were very smart. The family had a good reputation in the community and the nature of the crime. On September 10th of 1924, both were sentenced to life in prison and 99 additional years for kidnapping. Loeb's father died of heart failure a month later. So they were in Joliet prison, but Leopold and Loeb were both transferred at different times to Statesville Penitentiary in 1925. That's in Crest Hill, Illinois, which by looking at the map, it looked like it was closer to Chicago. It's, it's, it looked like it was north of Joliet. So um, when they were finally together again, they got together at Statesville Penitentiary and they both added a high school and junior college curriculum to the prison by they made like all kinds of contributions 
to the prison to do this. And on January 28th of 1936, Loeb was attacked. Inmate James Day claimed that Loeb tried to rape him, so he slashed him up with a razor, a straight razor, more than 50 wounds. Day was found not guilty in June of that year, so good for him. Um, now, it, there was no proof that Loeb actually tried to do anything with him. Uh, and then on top of that, James Day was later found in a, um, I don't know if he's actually having sex with somebody else in the prison or what. So he was found in that, you know, doing that in the prison. So who knows what happened, but Loeb died. So there you go. Um, Leopold continued being a model prisoner. He organized, reorganized the prison library, teaching and volunteering in the prison hospital. Now get this. He was released on parole after 33 years. March 13th of 1958, he was released. Everything he did in the prison to help people, um, the school, the library, the hospital, volunteering in the hospital was kind of like compensation for his crimes is what he said. Um, when he got out, he worked as a medical technician in Puerto Rico. And that was through the Church of the Brethren affiliated program. There was an autobiography in 1958 called Life Plus 99 Years. People accused him of writing this for, I don't even know if he actually wrote it, but it was his story. I don't think he actually wrote it, but um, they didn't think it was right that he could put out an autobiography. I know there's a law now that when prisoners do this, they cannot make money off of their crimes. Um, but he died of a heart attack related to diabetes on August 29th of 1971, I'm trying to read my handwriting, 1971, he was age 66. So, um, so yeah, that'd be about right. The crime inspired the play, 1929 play, Rope. Now, this is also an Alfred Hitchcock film. If nobody knows, I've got an Alfred Hitchcock set. I have seen that movie, um... I did not know that that's what th that was taken from. Um, but the movie, it, you could tell it's a play because I think it takes place in the same room the whole movie does. Um, I haven't watched it in years, but um, I remember it being different because it takes place all in one room. But, you know, it's, it's, it's based on a play. So you can see that it is. Um, but if anybody has not seen it, it is... It, it's worth checking out. I don't even think it's that long of a movie. Um, now, in 2019, I did not know this. The third season of The Sinner, which is on Netflix, the third season was based on the crime. Um, now, the third season I started watching, but I I didn't keep going because it was strange, getting very, very strange. And uh, it's just one of those that's kind of disturbing. I don't know. I might go back to it. But... <sighs> I'm just like, what is the deal here? I mean, the first two seasons I liked. The first season I loved. I mean, I loved once it once I got to know what was going on. I mean, it was, but this one, I don't know. I, I'm, I might go back to it. I There's four seasons of this and I haven't seen the fourth one either yet because I didn't even know there was a fourth one out, but I might go back to it and watch it. But Bill Pullman's in all of them. Man, he looks really, he, he looks like he's aging so much in this. I mean, I don't know if that's the part he's playing or what, but um, but he's the detective in, in all of them. So I might go back. I might take, but I didn't know that that was released. I mean, that that was based on it. I know that they do um, explain or the uh, the part with um, where they're reading the German philosopher, the Nietzsche guy, and they're um, talking about Superman and all that stuff and how they can be bigger and, and nothing can happen to them. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know. There's nobody that's, it's almost like they wanted to be immortal. And that is, you're human. You're human. You're not going to be Superman. I mean, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> It's just very, very strange to me for this philosophy, but about all of this. 
So that's the story of Leopold and Loeb. It's very disturbing. Um, Jeez. I just cannot imagine. I really can't. But I wanted to do this one. I know I know it was um one that was you know an older crime that a lot of people knew about. If you have any suggestions, let me know because I'm looking into um more in the area for the Midwest and I really want to find out more about you know different um different crimes i do like the older ones like this though but any of them will do you know i'm looking for so if anybody has any suggestions <clears throat> excuse me i'll leave my email and everything in the show notes i also have my instagram facebook i'm on x which used to be twitter and so there are many ways to get in touch if you want me to do a case in the midwest i try to stay in the midwest but i will do i will venture out further uh stories that need attention and um the patreon my patreon and spotify premium i do all over the episodes are from from all over so okay and i think yeah i just did um one about the actor the old actor jimmy ferrara that's the one that's the latest one right now on um spotify premium and patreon which is very interesting uh so there's i got quite a few old hollywood stories on there and many other ones so thank you all so much for your support have a wonderful february 1st is tomorrow hope you had a great january and look forward to february coming up and have a great one everybody and i will see you next time